What's going on, gang? And welcome back to Scared of Normal. I'm Mike Murphy, and today I'm joined by my co-host, Matt Cordova. And today we're sitting down just outside of Tampa, Florida with the founder of Boosted Boys, Kyle Wade. Dude, thank you so much for letting us come out to your house and uh, do a podcast with you. Yeah, of course. It's yeah. Been, a, been a minute, honestly. Dude, yeah. I mean, I think we've known each other for almost 15 years now, which is pretty bizarre to think about. It's been a long time. Yeah, I'm maybe not fit. 15 might be a stretch, but probably 10. It's it, it's in there, man. It's it's, it's up there. So, yeah, I, I've told you before and I told Matt on the way here, I'm like, this episode is one since when we started Scared of Normal. I was like, we need to get Kyle on. And like, it never lined up when you were in town. So we're out here in Florida and it worked out perfectly. So, yeah, I'm really excited about it, man. And uh, yeah, it's been cool to watch you work your ass off over the last, you know, seven, eight years and realize a dream and see what you've built for yourself. And yeah, it's really cool, man. So yeah, let's dig in. For people who have never heard of you, how would you describe yourself to them? Um, I'd say I'm honestly just pretty average, but driven guy. And I just kind of have a, a passion with what I do. And I've just stayed dedicated to it and it has turned into something I could have never imagined and uh there's still ways to go I think but yeah I don't know I don't know how to really describe myself but yeah it's kind of a loaded question yeah it is I don't answer I don't think there's honestly anything too special about me other than the fact that I I think I just work hard and don't give up and yeah. I think that can take you very far I think that's something I know a lot pretty special that's man. special in yeah, itself that's, right there, my that's the special part about me I guess yeah well I guess by the end of this episode people are going to be pretty familiar with you so I'm excited about that so let's get started with uh where you grew up man um I was born originally in Oklahoma City and I lived in Oklahoma till I was about six or seven and then I moved to Longmont when I was six or seven years old thank you yeah. and then yeah lived in Longmont my whole teenage life yeah for sure do you have any favorite childhood memories from running around Longmont, Colorado? There's a lot. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> going out I to remember, the skate park. Yeah, I remember back before the skate park across my parent because I I live right by Fall River Elementary out there, so that was the first little skate park where I got my in over there. Oh yeah. Before even that was built, it was just a dirt field. So me and my dad would go out there on a four wheeler back when that was like okay, and people were just like you know messing around with dirt bikes and four wheelers out there. And then yeah, eventually turned into the the park over there and. I uh, got a scooter for Christmas. I don't know how old I was when I first got that thing and I started going over there because that's all I had. Yeah. A little kick scooter and I just <laughs> showed up to the skate park and then all of the, the skate park side of my life kind of just took off after that. Just that's kept awesome. going back. Yeah. Would you say that was like probably your first passion was riding a scooter? Was that something that was your first? Um, I'd say my, it'd probably come down to the RC planes and cars. Okay. Probably the RC planes started first because my dad, was always into model aircraft and my grandpa was a big aviation guy. He was like kind of, my grandpa was kind of like mad scientist-y. Like he would, home, he'd make a whole, whole bunch of homemade stuff and he had these ultralights and he'd mess around with like homemade firearms and like stuff like <laughs> Wow. He was pretty, like realizing it now, when I was young I didn't realize it but now that I'm older I realized like he was a smart dude and like he was just always tinkering on stuff and I think I might have got that from him. Totally. Because That's it super passed cool. on to my dad and then me as well but yeah i started with the the rc planes a lot that was really all i would do on my pastime is just buy a model plane and my dad taught me to fly when i was young and i just go fly it at the park and that was pretty much it heck yeah dang well, that's really cool dude yeah. i didn't know that yeah <laughs> did your grandpa live in longmont or in the same area uh, no he lived in oklahoma as well okay so most of my family was from McAllister, oklahoma it's like a small town out there and then i was like i said born in oklahoma city which is like an hour or so, a couple hours away from McAllister. And uh, yeah, my dad moved to Colorado because he worked at Seagate and they had to basically relocate him to either Colorado or Minnesota. And my dad's family was originally from Colorado. Like he grew up and birthed. Huh. Then they all kind of, as far as I know, they just uprooted, moved to Oklahoma for whatever reason. And then it kind of came full circle with his job. And then he was given the option to go back to Colorado or Minnesota. And we're like, Minnesota's very cold, so we're not going there. <laughs> and then, yeah, we went back to Colorado. He ended and up then, in a pretty cool spot, man. Yeah, yeah, because he worked at the uh, the uh, Seagate right across the street from Silver Creek yep. High School. Dang, that's crazy. So that's crazy. why I ended up going there instead of like Skyline or something closer to me. For mm. sure. That makes a lot of sense. Um, do you still play with model aircraft? 
Uh, yeah, I got a couple. There's the the floater up there. I got an RC EDF jet up there somewhere too. Oh yeah, I remember seeing because I you at one point in time I remember you buying um a jet motor for an RC plane and then you put it on your scooter. Yeah, the little turbine engine, dude. I've always I'm always gonna be into like the RC play, planes and cars. I just love tinkering on the little motors and stuff. I think they're cool. Heck yeah, man. So we touched on the scooter thing a little bit. At you know, as you're growing up, was that something that you thought you were gonna do professionally? Because you were ripping there for the, you know, better part of your life. Yeah. And that's one of those things that it's like, I only think I got good at scootering because it's just what I enjoyed to do. And then I think there's that part of me that I think like it goes to say with anyone, if they're into their hobby or what they do, they're going to naturally kind of get good at it and stand out. Whereas like most kids in my position, they'd kind of, they'd kind of just like get somewhat good and then they'd be like yeah i'm kind of bored of that and move on yeah but like i started to get good at scootering because that's all i would do and then i would actually critically think i'm like how can i get better how can i do this trick how can i do that and i never got to where i wanted to be scootering either but i never thought i would uh do it professionally no i thought it was cool when we do like the little clothing stuff and like i i realized i got to a point where i was like yeah i'm i'm, I'm good i'm i'm happy with my progression but i never thought it would be something i would take up seriously because there was a part of me that was scared of the risks and and getting real messed up and sure. sending it because i was like watching other kids just breaking their arms and, and i i still have to this day knock on would never broke a bone in my body so no way yeah i've always been very conservative like when i do stuff i'm very i was always calculated with it and is if the risk outweighed the reward i was like yeah, i'm just gonna stay back dang that's super crazy that makes sense though honestly i could see that yeah yeah you were definitely very calculated on your shit. Yeah, if I, if I had a little bit more send it in me, I feel like I would have really progressed, but then I'm like, maybe I'd have a concussion. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, where did the crossroads start to happen when you started to discover cars? Was that from an earlier age before you like turned 16 where you were like, I'm really interested in cars or did you get your first car and it started blossoming from there? Yeah, it's a pretty funny story, I guess. Um, I was into the model airplanes and then that eventually just transitioned into cars kind of naturally. I'd still fly RC planes, but like my dad never cared for RC cars or anything like that. But some of my friends in school, you know, had a couple and then I started getting into that. So I'd pick up some of these RC cars and I'd start modifying those. So I was always, I was always into trying to make my RC car faster than my friends. So I would upgrade the motor, ECU, bigger batteries, like all that stuff. So when I eventually did end up getting a car, I didn't know much basically at all about like the aftermarket car world. I didn't know how fast cars were capable of being. It was just uh, not something I could really comprehend at the time, but I knew like Subarus were fast because back then it's like, oh, Subarus were cool. They made the cool wishy, wishy sounds when they went by. I was like, yeah. I want that. That thing sounds sick. <laughs> so I started like, yeah, I started getting into that, looking stuff up and I actually went and looked up a couple WRXs and me and my parents went to a used car lot and it was like this like bolt on WRX. It's like eight grand or something. And uh, I was working at, I think I was already working at Discount Tire at the time or just about to be, but I was, I was building up some money so I could, you know, try to help put some to it because they were also willing to help me get my first car as long as it was cheap. But like, totally. the Subarus were a little more. So I was like, oh, just let me, I'll help you guys pay for it if I can get one. And we ended up finding one at a used car lot and they saw it once. And I think we drove, like I had my dra dad drive it cause I couldn't even drive manual. And he like, <laughs> and he like floored it and he's like, no, nah, this thing's way too much for you. Like no this way. is a handful for you. Yeah. And they didn't let me get it cause they thought I was going to be reckless with it, which I probably would have been. But then they're like, look for something a little more practical and like reasonable. And then I don't know if either my dad mentioned it or how I found out about Honda Civics, but my attention to the being fast kind of went away and then i wanted something that looked cool and this was this was at that same time i was gonna buy your freaking yeah, hyundai the, the hyundai the little, man the little egg car which i still Eat have which skill. is even crazier yeah so this is like that time when you're like drifting that thing on the trays in the parking lot this is <laughs> i was looking actively looking for a car in that moment and that's when i was going to the skate park every day i'd ride from my house to the skate park like i was like a 30 to 45 minute trek on my just scooter pushing over me there and, yeah me and my buddies and they're on bikes so i'm just struggling to keep up so i was like <laughs> i need to get a car and i uh eventually looked up civics and then i really liked how the hatchbacks looked the i didn't know the years at the time but 
I saw some pictures on Google, just like slammed civics, like hatchbacks. And I just like thought they looked so dope. So I started looking for civics and I was like, they're way cheaper. They're reasonable. They're slow. My parents were like, yeah, that's a way better option than, you know, these freaking rally cars or whatever. But, um, so I ended up looking at a couple civics and then we landed on this one right here. And I got this from a guy in Denver and it was like 3000 bucks. The dude just swapped the motor in it. Cause he went to, uh, forgot what the community college is down there, but there's some big automotive school near there. And he went there. They like bought this as a project for the school. They swapped the motor. Then he ended up selling it later on. And I bought it from him. I still couldn't drive manual. So my dad drove it back to the house for me. And I, uh, I could ride, I could ride dirt bikes and stuff. And I understood the concept of the clutch and everything. So, um, basically my dad just told me to practice around the block and within the night I got it pretty figured out and then within you know a week I was going on the roads and stuff like when I had my permit and he would just come with me but I learned how to drive manual in this car and then eventually you know we get to the the part where I wanted to modify it and be faster than my friends because <laughs> all my friends in high school there was some there was some uh I don't know if I want to say like more privileged kids at my school but you know there's some kids showing up with their Audis and their, oh, yeah. and their Subarus oh, yeah. that I wanted and they're all way faster and cooler than my car. And I was like, dang, what can I do to a Honda Civic? Because at the time, like, it, it looks cool. It could be lowered. But I didn't know anything about making a car fast. And um, sure enough, I Google modifying a Honda Civic. And it's like the most modified car in the world. You just the fell into biggest it. biggest aftermarket support. I mean, at the time, I I had the two biggest things against me in both my respective uh interests i would go to the skate park and i was the one kid on a scooter and then i'd go to a car meet and i was the one kid in a honda <laughs> civic i was like the most hated upon in each group and now it's funny because they've both like flopped now it's like scooter kids are everywhere and there's kids and yeah. now people like have respect for honda civics yeah it's kind it's of funny pretty crazy because when i did it everyone like thought i was a dip i was like this kid's on a scooter screw him he's driving a piece of shit civic so i'd show up to a skate park in my civic oh man and then we, and then they're like they see the civic pulling up they're like oh this kid's already a dip who whatever he pulls out and then i pull a scooter out they're like oh my oh, god no. you know what Can they say any worse it's about two two negatives man that makes a positive yeah yeah it worked out man <laughs> so, they're, yeah. they're all yeah you're laughing at well it, i yeah. love love the fact that you basically fell into this car that you had no idea how modifiable it was or anything like that and like literally it's created a life for you and you still have it in your possession like you'll probably never let this thing go right no i mean unless i unfortunately like wreck it or some something happens to the car which i hope it doesn't but i never plan on selling that car yeah that's so cool that you still like it's such a big part of your story and then it's still with you like that's incredible yeah and a lot of it on the inside still like how it was it's still the same seats still like the same stock steering wheel like there's a lot of parts of it that i didn't want to get rid of because it's a little nostalgic to me yeah, yeah but it'll probably get upgraded eventually do you remember what your first uh aftermarket like part that you put on that car was uh yeah at the time it was literally just like one of those little coal air intakes that you slap on sick probably ordered it off ebay or something but i actually kind of just dove right in when i got the civic because um i mean i went i just i had a full send it like i knew nothing and i was like i want to make my car fast and I saw you could do motor swaps. I was working at Discount Tire, and at the time I was maybe a junior in high school because it took me, like right as high school was becoming over for me, I got got it running with the new motor, which was just like a little too late because I was pissed. I was like, damn, I'm going to graduate high school and these kids aren't going to know how fast I am. <laughs> That's my biggest regret is not finishing it sooner. But um, I got it pulled apart like probably my junior year or the summer after junior year, and at the time... Um, there's this website called H motors online and that's where you buy all these Honda motors. And, um, there's like the three popular, well, two popular ones at the time. There's either B series or K, K series. And at that time they were both expensive options and I didn't even know how to turbo a car or anything. So I was looking for the most, just drop in most ready to go power. Yep. And this is, was a bone stock car. My only modification was a cold air intake. So I'm way out of my expertise here. I actually had an axle break on it and I was taking it to a shop just to fix a little, CV axle. So I knew nothing. And then I saved up enough money. It was like a little over two grand for everything. And there was the, the H motor was like the third option, which made just as much as the B series, just as much as the K series. But it, for some reason it was like 
half the price. And I didn't really, really know why. And I asked a couple people and one of the guys I worked at discount tire with actually was like, Oh, just throw an H 22 in that thing. Like I had one in my Accord turbo, it was fast. And I was like, whatever, it was way cheaper than the K and B. So I bought this guide, how to do it online. And I pulled the trigger on it. Didn't tell my mom. And this semi truck showed up in our cul-de-sac and just oh, dropped this crate motor. <laughs> Your and, mom was uh, probably like, what the hell uh, is going she on? Was, she was, not happy and then she was even more mad when i got the the turbo stuff for it because that was an even more expensive order but i ended up getting the h22 for it and i just started going to town i just me and my dad looked up videos like how to pull a honda civic engine and we just started wow. going like no ex zero experience and i was just we just started pulling shit apart and were you were you graduated from high school at that point or you i was still in high school okay. while we started started the, swap, the project because it was running right as high school was about to be over so it took me probably it took me like eight months or so to get it going just because i didn't know anything so everything was very little by little i'd be missing one little part and it would set me back a month just because i didn't know how or where to find it sure where nowadays i'm like well, that's nothing well and the internet's come so far yeah, too like, it's not like you can get on amazon and it'll be here tomorrow you know mm -hmm. like, that's crazy yeah that's back when you would order something on ebay and even though it's local it'd still take like three four weeks to yeah, get to you hope that it shows yeah. up uh, talking about high school, did you have any favorite subjects in school? Mm. Did you like school, I guess, is the first question. Yeah, I did. Um, I mean, definitely my favorite was welding because I took welding three years in high school, I believe, because I couldn't take it freshman year, but they had the thing called the career development program, which was a separate building, and they would actually put you on a bus and drive you That's 20 so minutes cool. away, and that was one of my objectives was welding, and I took that all three years of high school and that was like the only class i looked forward to because i actually enjoyed all the other stuff i was just pretty mundane doing it to do it yeah. yeah and i was pretty i was pretty good in high school i didn't i wasn't like an overachiever or anything but i would you know turn my homework in i'd have very average average to decent grades and i never took a a free block i never like you had the option to take a free block if you like didn't fill them yep i made sure i filled all my all my stuff as soon as I could. So by the time I got to my senior year, I could have graduated early as a junior, but the only reason I stayed in school was to keep doing the welding classes for free. So oh, that's I, cool. So I only had one English class because I had to get the four years of English, but all through high or my senior year, by the time I got to all that, I just had one, one welding class every day and then my English class every other day. That's awesome. So I'd show up for English for an hour and a half, then do my welding. And then the next day I'd just be welding. Then that's it. So then like when you have those late start days or whatever, if it was just a, a B day or whatever it was where it was just welding, uh, the career development days were skipped on those. So like some days I just wouldn't even have to go to school, but I made it easy for myself. I'd wake up, go to school at 10, be out by, you know, one thirty, And then the next day I'd go in. Then like every other day I wouldn't even have to go to the physical high school because yeah. I'd just go to the CDC. And by that time I had my car and I could drive and, uh, yeah, I'll just go do that. That's super cool. I think I actually had to borrow my parents' Jeep a lot because I was working on the Yeah, Civic. I was going to ask, what were you doing when you didn't have your car? Yeah. Yeah, borrowing a car. Yeah, no, I think all sophomore year, I had this, or junior year I had it, so I was zipping back and forth with the Civic for that, but then my senior year when it was being worked on, I had my parents' Jeep Cherokee, and I would go back and forth with that. That's super cool. So you're talking about tearing this car apart, you and your dad are watching videos, presumably on YouTube, at what point did you decide that you were going to start filming what you guys were doing and putting it on YouTube? What was your first mm. video? There's a few steps in between that. Um, so we got the car running and driving. And by the time I started filming videos, the car had already been like, it had a built, the motor had come back out. I had built it, made it faster. At that time, when we first started the channel, the car made like 450 horsepower. And so that was probably another almost a year and a half, two year gap after high school before I first started filming because I got out of high school, got the H swap done. And then I'd still, I'd continue to work on the car and modify it. And then eventually I learned about turbo kits and stuff and how to turbo it. So I ended up turboing the car and I went to Ames Community College in Greeley. And then I continued my welding stuff for two more years while I had the Civic. And then that's when I started the YouTube stuff was like my last semester or last year maybe of uh, the welding school. And then like the channel started to grow while I was still in school. 
I almost had to, I almost didn't make it through school because I started focusing more and more on the channel. Really? And yeah, it started when I would, I would go on, I was always obsessed with YouTube. Something else that I didn't say at the beginning of this is I have another channel that's like 14 or 15 years old now that you can look up and it's videos of me flying my RC planes and I'd make little, I'd like do little modifications to the planes and stuff or like I had one of the, these little micro RC, like low C RC cars and I would take the body off it and you can hear my like 10 year old voice. I'm like, <laughs> like I put these LEDs in here and I like, that's awesome. I wired the body, like have little lights on the body. So you like see it at night. Like, oh, that's so I'd sick. Put like little trap doors on my planes, like cut them up and like just mess with them. Oh, that's cool. And so that was my first YouTube channel way back then. And I was always into YouTube. I always watch it. I'd usually watch RC stuff because that's all I would, was really into. And then eventually it translated into car stuff because a lot of how I would figure out how fast other people's cars were, or like if I do this modification or this and that was through YouTube. I'd type in other people who had H22 Civics, which weren't many, which I didn't know, but I'd type in like Turbo Civic and I'd see like all these dudes with crazy Civics on YouTube. So I just keep digging and digging like, how are they doing this? Cause I want to do that to my car. And um, eventually, you know, I found some more youtubers that were more personal and like filming their daily life and stuff and um i figured we could do the same thing because like we got i had my civic that i felt for my age and my time i was like we were going out every night to car meets just like ripping on it just racing whoever and i was like i feel like people would watch this stuff so i just started filming just like kind of our daily life whenever we would go mess with the car stuff and it just started from there Dang, that's so sick. And that was back in 2015 when you started it, right? Yeah, roughly. I'd say end of 2015, I started posting some like here and there videos. And then uh, 20, it was like August of 2016 is when I really took it serious. Because yeah. that's when I moved into the house in Loveland. That's when I like officially moved out of my parents' house. And then once I got that house, I got it specifically because it had a decent sized garage. And I had saved up a ton from discount tire because I worked or I lived with my parents for, you know, obviously this whole time. And besides the car, I didn't spend a dime on anything. Zero. So I I got the stuff I needed for my car, but I wasn't buying anything dumb. I wasn't buying clothes, food, whatever. Like my parents would help me cover a lot of the stuff. I had no rent. So besides just food and like buying stuff for my car periodically, I would save every cent I could. So I had a lot to, uh, live off of like we were able to move in this house and i knew i was good for like probably a year just off savings so i decided while i was doing that because i was going to school at the same time so my thought was i'll go to school with the savings by the time i get out of school i'll have the certificates and stuff i need to get a job yeah and then i can catch back up on my bills eventually and hopefully i don't and, run out and you weren't working at discount tire at this time no. right once i okay. moved to loveland i quit discount i actually worked at a body shop for a year and a half right after discount tire when I was still in Longmont. And uh, then I ended up leaving that to go to school. And then, yeah, we moved into that house. And that's when I had already had a couple videos up, nothing really crazy happened of it, but I, we started messing with the cars every day because I was just so into it. So then I was like, I'm gonna try to see where this goes. And back then I didn't really know YouTube could, was a sustainable like source of income. I just, I really just did it to do it because I thought it was cool. Yeah. I still had full intentions of like having to, to get a real job and stuff. Uh, you were just having eventually, fun. But yeah, I was just having fun and eventually it just turned into what it did. That's so crazy. What, do you remember like a pinnacle video that like kind of t tipped you past that point and you're like, whoa, this could be like a real thing? Yeah, we had, we had a couple. I think the first, the first major one that we were talking about earlier when you got here was the <laughs> the civic jump in the intersection so the channel was still really small at that point but yeah we took that civic wagon not the same one i have now but we jumped that intersection in longmont and i had made a few other videos since then that just hadn't blown up yet so we did that video and then we made another video where we took this red civic and it was just called racing random people on the side of the road and we just literally sat on the on-ramp and we would just wait for like a Mustang or court. We were just hoping to see any sort of sporty car, like something yeah. that you'd be considered quick or fast. And I was like, we'll just go race them. we go see what's up. And we just did that. It was shot really crappily, but we literally shot that whole video in like a couple hours. And a lot of people think it was like some of them were fake or set up, but we genuinely like found these cars within the span. That's of, funny. Because we actually pull up to 
to film this video and then this like rx8 just blasts by us on the on-ramp we're like well there's our first guy and people are like that was set up i was like <laughs> but i literally just happened to this dude flew right past us and then, yeah we raced like three or four cars in that video and i posted it not ever and when i when i posted these i never had the intention of like this is gonna go viral I yeah no i just kind of like thought it was a cool idea yeah but i didn't really like think anything of it and then i posted that nothing happened to it it was like dead in the water and then it was like maybe a month or two later, I want to say. I could be wrong about all this. It was so long ago, but I'm pretty sure I already posted a few videos like that on the channel. And then a page called Car Throttle on Facebook shared our the video of the Civic jump and stuff. And they're like, tag a friend who drives or treats their car like this. And it's us jumping it and like just beating the shit out of this thing. And then that sent a lot of traffic to our page in that specific video. And then that kickstarted the other videos to start getting traction. And then they like hopped on the algorithm and out of nowhere, we'd like, took off to like 50,000 subs wow. within a couple of weeks. And then it was just steady growth from there. Yeah. And at that point, like obviously the channel becomes monetized where you like, I can make a living off of this or were yeah. you still just like, I still need to get a job. Um, I still think I was, I need to get a job. But my thought was I'll never be able to make as much money doing this as I could being a, like a pipe welder or fabricator or something. And I don't remember when it was exactly, but, it all happened actually pretty fast. I want to within the because I said we we really took it serious uh, like August of 2016, and by December I think we had our first like hundred dollar check from YouTube. So within a few months it started doing something, and then not too long after that, like the next couple months after that, we were getting like five six hundred bucks. The next months following that, and even that was like blowing me away because I'm like, damn, that's like my rent almost. Yeah, and I was like, dude, if I could, then that was my original goal. It's like if this can just cover my basic bills. And then I just have a normal job for yeah. like to fund this. Then like I was pumped on that because I was like, well, if my normal job fails, I got this to like just cover bills. Sure. And then um, I just kept sticking to it and it just kept growing and growing. And then it got to a point where probably, you know, not too deep into 2017, I realized I could do something with this. I was like, I'm just going to keep focusing on this. And then that's when I started distancing myself more from the the trade school. But I still managed to finish and get all my certificates there. Cause uh, actually one of the last, our channel was like maybe at this point, like over a hundred thousand subs, like maybe 120. And I got invited to do this YouTuber call out challenge in Florida. And that's when I brought the minivan to Daytona. And, you know, a lot had already happened up until that point, but that's like right when I was getting ready to finish school and they're like, well, you guys can come. And it was super last minute and it, I had to take a week off and I was already like, I was getting all my assignments and everything done, but they were, they were pestering me because i wasn't putting the hours in like sure. you could get an a in everything pass all your tests but you have to have a mandatory amount of hours and i didn't meet that so when i got back they actually said i failed and i was like i was pissed i actually like started tearing up i'm like dude this is fucked up i was like i did all this shit i got and i was like i was actually one of the best students in that class and they know it. i got all my welding accomplishments were great like they knew i was good because i would just get my shit done and get out and go do youtube and they ended up passing me. So no like, way. Yeah. They called it good. So then I ended up graduating, doing all that, got my certificates, and then I never used any of it. <laughs> what a sick teacher, though, for them to, like, recognize, like, that you were actually pouring into a passion project outside of school, and then you were showing up and, like, busting your ass there, yeah. too. And, like, yeah. I doubt he'll ever it. see it, but his name was it was Jeff. So shout out Jeff. He was probably the coolest teacher I ever had. That's so I don't sick. know if you'll watch it, but he actually let me come back because he was actually really interested in what I was doing once they started realizing. That's when I think he realized what it was because um, at the time he didn't realize, but I had I had done the YouTube channel after the school and I, I hit him up because I had his personal number somehow. I don't remember how I had his number, but I ended up messaging him because our welding school had a CNC plasma table and i wanted to cut out a big weight plate for this civic right here it's that piece of metal hanging off the bumper that's oh, still yeah. on there dang that's a big chunk of steel yeah it weighs like 100 pounds because <laughs> back when that car was only front wheel drive when they would take them to the drag strip you want the extra weight on the nose sure helps give them traction because like when they take off all the weight transfers to the rear so um i called him i was like can i come back to the school and this was like months or maybe even a year after i had already left and i was like can i borrow the, the table to cut this thing out and he's like yeah and i came by and um that's when he like he he came up to me and he's like he's like man i didn't realize what you were doing was like so serious he's like i had dinner with my kids one day and it like came up randomly that like like youtubers and stuff 
and I had mentioned that like I had a YouTuber in my class and I mentioned you to my son and he's like, oh, who is it? And he's like, oh, Boosted Boys. And he's like, my son's face just went like, oh, who, which one? And he's like, Kyle. And he's like, oh, no way. <laughs> and Whoa. so like, and that, like, and then my teacher realized like it wasn't something just like, he realized it, there was something to it. And then he understood like why I was going and doing all that stuff. So dang, that's sick. It's it sick too cool. that he let you like come back and like there was that level of respect there. Yeah. That's yeah, I wish awesome. I could. I wanted to. If I still lived in Colorado, I wanted to because I always did the reaction videos. I wanted to take him for a ride. In the oh, car. that would be a that good be one, sick. dude. Yeah, because I actually filmed going to the the school and filming that being cut out and stuff. And everyone's like, "Your teacher is so awesome." That's so cool. But so outside of like the welding classes and like going to you know the trade school for welding, you basically taught yourself how to do everything, correct? Um, for with them, the cars, yeah, yeah, it's pretty much all self taught. That's crazy, man. Just was that, the internet. yeah, a lot of trial and error and the internet. and Yeah. I would just, like I said, I'd go online, a lot of forums, like reading, because that's back when forums were big and every part of everything. So I would just go online, see what other people were doing and just saw what worked. I was like, this person is running these parts in the same engine I have with the same turbo with, and they made 500 horsepower so if i do the same i should obviously get the same results so i just just uh dug deep and saw what people were doing and yeah i just figured it out i don't know that's super cool do you think you learned a lot by like making the videos and like breaking stuff and people commenting or was it more of just kind of white noise in the background and people are like you're doing that wrong or oh yeah it was definitely more yeah like white noise in the background because so many people criticized what I did and they had the right to because a lot of stuff I did was kind of not to the book but the way I did things was extremely budget but work like I got away with like the most cheap way you could do something but like it actually performs so like my Civic back then it's still not that great but it was so hacked up then like I definitely even to this day I definitely still cut corners but it's just because I'm I'm like trying to get so many little things done. Like now I have Wyatt and stuff here and they clean up my loose ends. But <laughs> no matter what people would say, I would always prove them wrong. They're like, that won't work. This, there's no way. And like, I'd go do something and they're like, damn, that thing's actually fast. I think, and that's, I think that's cool. why a lot of people kind of gravitated to it. Cause I could do stuff on like an extremely tight budget. Yeah. Well, it's so relatable. Cause most people don't have the cash to go out and buy like the most expensive stuff or take it to a shop or like have the access to all the crazy tools so the fact that you're like in your garage doing it with tools from harbor freight at the time like that's pretty crazy man and you've got cars running like crazy times at the track like insane yeah I th and i think that's where the first car being a honda civic was a blessing in disguise because it's like like i said the biggest aftermarket support is for a honda civic i don't know if that's still true today but at the time it was like on ebay you type in honda civic headlights and you got like 200 different Chinese brands of just like here you go and there's like all this supply and demand so I mean it just made the parts cheap and also the junkyards are filled with them mm -hmm. with Civics and Accords because they were they made so many of them so like I would break stuff like in the transmission and I'd go to the junkyard and just like pull a tranny out of a car and get it for a hundred bucks and be back That's in business so or if it was like a Corvette or a GTR you know they're down yeah. 10 grand or something or even that Subaru that you want yeah be done you know? dude it's all, every head gasket would have been blown in that thing so, I got it. So going back to that Loveland house, you're talking about making, you know, five, six hundred dollars a month on YouTube, where your parents now looking at this little red hatchback saying, like, oh shit, this thing's pretty <laughs> fast. Were they like scared for you or were they like not really sure of what was going on mm -hmm. at that point in time? I don't know if they really understood. I remember them kind of just telling me to be careful with it. Yeah. But I don't think I think they always trusted me that I wasn't like they could see I wasn't an idiot when I do things. Like I wasn't hanging around like doing drugs like being stupid they yeah. they're like we trust you just don't yeah mess up <laughs> they knew you had that calculated yeah, they, they attitude knew, uh, they knew i had that lack of send it so like i'm yeah i'm calculating i'm like if this is sketch i'm probably gonna back off a little bit but then i'd still do some sketchy stuff sometimes so <laughs> it was a fine balance it's pretty funny to think if you would have gotten that subaru all those years ago we might not be sitting right here right now oh dude i would have been broke the first day <laughs> no way <laughs> yeah something goes down on that car and it's all over yeah man. it's all over i probably would have been like screw this and maybe i'd be scooter and more who knows yeah who knows that thing would have made me scooter to the skate park every day <laughs> so i would have turned it way too far up <laughs> so where did you go from the loveland house making you know six seven hundred bucks a month like where does it go from there 
What was um, the next step in the progression? Was it a new car? Well, I mean, pretty quickly after the few hundred dollars, we were making, you know, a couple thousand right away. And I had my red Civic and then I had my blue wagon that's outside. I bought the blue wagon as a daily because when this one was like down or, you know, upgrading it, I uh, would drive the blue one around. And at the time we started the channel, this one was like kind of done for when I was building it like for my standard it was done it made yeah. like 400 horsepower it's like it's done this You're is like, sick i can't I do it race it every night yeah and then so we started the channel and then i don't know why i decided to do it because i don't i didn't have another car but well at some point i bought this minivan that's outside it was like 500 bucks and then that turned into my daily and then i started building the blue wagon which is out here and then my friend charlie who had one also uh, was building his as well and then that's where our videos really started we were building our wagons together and we would just okay. like go do stuff with our wagons and then they're like oh when a real fast car comes we like we bust out the hatch and we show them a thing or two like that was our thing like <laughs> like oh they, they put them up against the hatch because everyone knew my hatch is like the fast car even though back then it wasn't that crazy but to our f group of friends it was like yeah that thing it was, was gnarly cool. i remember we were out there i very vividly remember the first time that i think it was probably right after you had turboed it for the first time and you came to the skate park and we were all sitting there and you were like all smiling, telling everybody about it. And I was like, it can't be that fast. And I jumped in it and we like did a pull down the highway and came back and I was like, I'm like terrified that <laughs> little tiny Kyle is driving that car. Yeah. It was fast, man. Uh, every time I leave the skate park, I just rip second <laughs> gear down that road. I just <laughs> let everyone know what's up. Yeah. But, that's so funny, man. Yeah. We started building the wagons and then like. We do stuff with the hatch here and there. Like the hatch was always like the weekend car. Like we'd film our weekly days working on the wagons, just like dicking around like our our daily life. And then we'd go out on the weekends in the hatch and we would race people on the street, like GTRs, like all kinds of stuff. And then eventually it turned more towards the track and we started going to the track more because people, I don't know if it was comments. I don't, it was probably a mix of the comments, people of or the, the risk of getting caught and like, arrested for all the street racing yeah and whatever else it may be but i decided to start going to the drag strip more and trying to actually i think a lot of people were doubting it like oh i bet you it's actually pretty slow in the quarter this and that for some reason the quarter mile started showing up in the comments and i'm mm -hmm. like hmm, i wonder how fast it actually is and then went to the drag strip and it was pretty slow at first and then I just tried to figure out how to make it faster and faster at the drag strip so then that was my thing like every weekend i would be or it'd be like every Wednesday because that's when Bandamere was open for test and tune. So every Wednesday I'd go to the drag strip with the Civic and I bought a pair of slicks for it and I'd go out there and like just try to go faster and faster with it and like learn everything about drag racing. And you, know? you were driving it down to the track at that point. At that time, point, right? yeah, I would drive it there with the slicks in the back seat and I'd usually bring my pit bike, my little, which is here somewhere, my little 50. Yeah. And I'd throw it in the hatch because it would fit back there. <laughs> This was before it had a cage too. And I'd just toss all my stuff in there, a couple tools and a little jack to change my tires. I'd go to the track, run some times, and and then go home. And then there's obviously a couple times I'd like break the car at the track, and I had to get it towed home a couple times. And and then the car got faster and faster at the track. I kept turning it up, and like I when I originally built the engine, um, didn't realize how like over built I had it. I I over, I way overbuilt the motor, which was a good thing. And it, it just so happened like I got so lucky because I didn't know anything, but the H22 is a factory closed deck block which in the car world is a there's normally a big gap between the cylinder for coolant to go around and the h22 is from factory closed deck which means it has a whole bunch of material connecting the outer edge of the block to the cylinder so that gap has material supporting it and what happens when you turn up a car that's boosted that's an open sleeve block that's factory so much pressure builds up in the the cylinder that without that upper support the the sleeve will actually crack it Whoa. will try to expand because there's so much boost and there's such a big explosion going sure. on in there that the pressures are so great that it can rupture it and pull it apart so when they upgrade blocks they sleeve it and they machine them out and they press in these uh supported sleeves that have that wall built into it but the h22 had it from factory so just putting the the rods and pistons in it i had like a 700 horse power motor when i was only trying to make like 300 whoa and i never realized that was that thanks to the forums too at the time like that you were reading kind of yeah. yeah like i saw one guy had one on there made like four or five hundred and that was like the highest horsepower one that i could find at the time so i'm like oh it should be able to make like four or five hundred maybe on turned up and 
And so I got it to like that mid 400, like mid 400 range. And I was like, this is probably safe here. I probably won't blow it up because there's these other guys doing it. And that's that. And then that's back when I, and when I first had to get the car tuned, that's the one thing I didn't know how to do on my own was tune the car. So I took it to PFI, which is Brent PFI speed. And that's how that relationship with him started. I was just always going over to his dyno and then I was trying to, and like, and they were just like awesome car people. So I just hang out with them because I liked these guys. I was like, these are cool people. So I just go and hang out with them eventually after I met them through dynoing my car and I'd start filming videos at PFI as well yeah. and I'd show all these cool cars they had on the dyno and like because they had all kinds of crazy stuff going on and at that point did they realize like the whole YouTube thing like how crazy it was or were they just like what is this kid doing bringing his camera around and they here? were they were definitely like what is this kid doing <laughs> and uh it got to a point though where it's like kids started watching me and stuff and they realized oh it's pretty big and then yeah, I'm started, sure people started bringing their yeah, cars to yeah, them yeah and I started I shouted them out like all the time like every video I was there I was like oh but PFI it was a reoccurring thing because I was like I need one little part for the car and I'm like oh I'm over at PFI see if they have it laying around so it was like a reoccurring thing like fine no matter how crazy the item I needed like Brent had it laying around that's like that was the you know like a top comment be like I needed a girlfriend so I went to PFI because Brent had one laying around like (laughs) stuff like that but yeah I'd go there and then Brent's the one that kind of told he's like your motor it's like if you have that stuff in it we can definitely turn it harder and I was like, fuck it, turn it up. Let's go. <laughs> and then it made like 600. And then I just keep going back to the track. And at that time I was, I was always pushing for a 10 second pass in the quarter. Like that was in Colorado, like a car that could drive off the street and run a 10 and like go home. That was very impressive Yeah. for anyone I talked to or hung out with. Like none of my friends were anywhere near a 10 second car. It's like all 12s and maybe the fast ones were 11. So I was like, I want to run a 10 second quarter and drive it home. And uh, eventually started, I started doing that. And I got that goal out of the way. So like all those drag racing videos and like following me to to how I got to those and like all the failures and upgrading because I at some point I had to upgrade the clutch and all those videos just kept growing the following in between what we were doing with the other projects. And at that time, I think I picked up the MR2. So I was like messing with, I was starting to case swap the white MR2 on the yeah. background. So it had its own little video series going and I was building the little shopping go-kart. So I'd film videos of it and its videos were doing good so i was like doing all this other little side stuff that was just starting to branch starting out. starting to grow the channel yeah it's like i need to start doing more little projects because they're gonna get tired if all i focus on is the yeah. civic and at that point in time is that like your full time job is it, creating yeah. videos at yeah. that point it's full time i'm done with school and i'm just trying to post as much as i can and just try to think what's interesting and yeah. how i can you know grow our subscriber base when, sure. when you're making a video or filming or anything is it hard for you to like put in uh, like an intimate moment or like or do you put everything in or how, how, how do you do your formatting um i usually i keep it pretty real like i don't leave anything out if that's kind of what you're asking but <laughs> um yeah i mean i i show every step of the way i don't show like if something breaks i show it if you know, a lot of people will hide a failure. Yeah. Like if I break a bolt off on camera or something, someone's going to be like, oh, I don't want people to see that I messed that up. I'm like, I don't care. I just, I literally show every little step I had to take to get the car to where they were because a lot of people don't see that it's really like anyone can do it. Yeah. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Cause when I got into all the car stuff, like there was a car, there was a video of a Civic because I wanted to know what's the fastest Civic in the world. So I type in on Google, world's fastest, or on YouTube, world's fastest Civic. And um, this video of like Speed Factory Racing Civic pops up. And at that time, it's going like mid sevens at 200 miles an hour in the Jeez. quarter. And I'm like, and I'm sitting there watching this video. And I, I I genuinely can't comprehend how that's possible. I'm like, how is that little motor like just not exploding? And um, I'm like, the only the only explanation for this is it's rocket scientists. Like that put like they're probably building this car in a lab with like yeah. every dro- drop of gas is like mixed in a vial or some. Like I thought it was crazy. I was like, there's it has to be perfect. If one little thing goes wrong, like it's catastrophic. It's like I thought it, I thought the pe- same people there that were building these cars were like capable of building a space shuttle or something. Sure. But then once like, you really start to get into it, it's like, dude, these are just normal normal ass dudes. Yeah. And really anyone could do it. So. Um, I think that's just something I didn't realize. So then when I started making the videos of what I was doing, I thought to myself, what would someone who doesn't know anything about this want to see? Because they would realize like, oh, I'm just like pretty normal and really not that smart. I'm just dedicated to it. And I just like to show every step because if I only showed my success, they'd think I'm 
way smarter and yeah. way more successful. They would think Every, you were a rocket scientist. Yes, yeah, they would, and I'm <laughs> not. And like most, like 90% of our videos are stuff going wrong and stuff breaking, and yeah. people like to see that. And then it all pays off for that 10% things go right. Yeah. And then like it's like a big cycle. It's like break, 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 fix, fix, fix. And like, oh, this is so shitty. And then we finally, it finally pays off, and we like get our goal and we're all hyped. And then everyone's like, oh, shit, look, they did it. And then it's like, the and then it just starts over again with yeah. a new car or a new goal well i think there's a ton of beauty in that too like talking about those intimate moments and like showing the hard stuff that you know some people choose to not show like i love that you're aware of how it makes true content you know very authentic content because most people will not show that and like you're saying it creates this barrier to entry for people where they're like i i would like to do that but i could never and like yeah. the fact that you're basically making it for every person to show like yeah you might say i'm doing this like a ghetto way but like it works and you can do this mm -hmm. too and like you can build from here like seeing your work from the beginning to the way you build stuff now is like freaking insane to me like it's cool to see that progression of the cars from when you first started this channel to now you know yeah and it's like, pretty wild yeah if you go back and watch your earlier videos compared to the stuff now like the level of work and like the attention to detail that you have is only you had to earn that through making mistakes. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, that's the only way you can learn that stuff. So showing people that is like, that's valuable, man. It's yeah. super cool. Like I said, definitely ought to give a shout out to Wyatt for some of the, uh, the attention to detail, but I definitely got a lot better at what I was doing. So like the car I took most pride in, it was probably the MR2 because even before I had Wyatt working for me, there was a moment in, when I first moved out here, I was completely on my own and every single like nut and bolt, everything that was done to the white MR2 was done by me. Like not a wow. single thing I didn't do at that time. I did, it's since been upgraded, but at that time I did the roll cage. I built the engine that was in the car. I did the, I fabricated all the exhaust off the turbo kit, making the turbo kit, the charge pipes. I fabricated everything, did the whole car completely on my own, built the transmission, like top, like no, I didn't outsource anything. And just after doing that, I was able to basically build the fastest one in the world off, off like maybe a hundredth. I was right there next to the fastest guy out there and it did like an eight, three, it, like 170 something miles an hour. And I was proud of the MR2 at that point because that just showed at that point I was like, I basically reached my goal with that car completely on my own. And I was just like, this is it? I can do it. There's like some loose ends I could have buttoned up on it, but, um, you know, like that version of myself to my younger self would have been just like my younger self seeing me do what I did to that car would have been very proud. So I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm done here. Well, you would have probably watched or looked at that car on YouTube if it wasn't you making it and have been like, wow, that's insane. That would have probably been that rocket scientist kind of, <laughs> yeah. you know, perspective and like the fact that you were a one man show at that point in time, like that's pretty insane to achieve a goal like that. Was it overwhelming to be doing that kind of solo at that point in time? Not really. It's honestly, it, it's it's honestly more overwhelming now. I'd say it's really? almost easier, more laid back, just by myself because I only had to focus on me and just not worry about anyone else. Not saying it's bad now, but there's more involved. I mean, I only have two people working for me right now, but um, it was just easier to manage my day to day life because all I thought about was just basically what I'm doing today and sure. what I need and. I was doing good on the videos and it was just simple. Like I didn't have any other external thoughts. I was just yeah. like, I got to get this done today. I'm going to film it, upload, keep working tomorrow. Sure. It's like, it was pretty simple. Yeah. But gets, now I'm like, now I got to run the, now it's like a business. Yeah. Like, oh, shit, you have to do. manage people and delegate yeah. tasks. I'm still over here like twiddling my thumbs, like how to set up a QuickBooks and <laughs> doing all these taxes and everything. And I'm just like, oh It gosh. becomes a lot, man. When I'm it just like, I'd into... rather just keep working on the car <laughs> yeah. and make videos. But then now- everything else has come with it that I honestly am not as good as it doing, but I'm getting there. Yeah, for sure. Um, I want to jump back to when you said you started like focusing on going to the track a little bit more because you were scared of like making a mistake in the street, whether that was getting in trouble or crashing. Did you ever get in trouble? Um, no, not specifically for anything I did. We had one video where we, I was with my friend and we like flew past a cop going all fast and I uploaded it. And they ended up looking for our friend and he actually had to go to court and stuff for it. So he got in some trouble for that, but 
I was never in trouble for anything. That's awesome. But yeah, that was kind of a whole ordeal. Do you ever look back on that period of time and wonder how you didn't get in more trouble? Um, not really. I just rather not think about it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> just like we got lucky. And when we're you guys good. were down in Mexico every day. Yeah, I mean, we were in Mexico, so it's not like they could have charged us for anything. That's true. It was over the border. Yeah, but. fair enough. So we talked a little bit about you moving down to Florida. What spurred that change in your life? Uh, we would come down here pretty often to do some stuff with other car YouTubers down here, like we know Cletus and all them. So we would come down for events that were happening in Florida and a lot of the guys down here, you know, I quickly realized they can just do it all year round. There's a huge racing scene here and they never have to stop because it's 24 seven. Whereas in Colorado, we only have the one drag strip and it's closed half the year. So when it's winter, we really can't do too much. We're Mm. just, you know, we're playing in the snow and that's fun. Make some snow videos. Like I drift my wagon around in the snow for a video, but it gets old pretty quick and there's only so much you can do with snow everywhere on the ground and it sucks to work in the cold if luckily we had a heater in our garage there and we had a heater in the shop but something about being in the cold just makes you not want to touch your car at all like having cold hands working on stuff it's terrible at least for me so I was yeah. over that and then every time I'd come down here it just like it just felt right I was like we just I just want to be here more and yeah at some point when I was in Colorado um you know I was in a position just to kind of send it to come out here and i found this property and we ended up getting this place sight unseen too no way i had my friend that lived down here uh emilio's brother ricky he came down and just sent me a quick video like a video tour of the place it was like a three or four minute video like two separate two couple long minute videos and they just walked through the house showed me the inside of the shop and i was like yeah that that place looks pretty perfect and that's crazy good price i was just like screw it and we made the, the deal happen over the phone and I loaded up two cars. I had my Dodge truck and I brought the white MR2 and that pink 240 outside. I just put them on a two car trailer and I just packed up as much stuff as I could and I just sent it and I just came down wow. here by myself and I just, <laughs> this place had no power when I got here, no running water and I just, I rolled in probably like three, three in the morning and then because I also just drove straight here on my own, and it's a 28-hour drive, Dang. which I've done a couple times for the events and stuff, but I've usually had help. So yeah. I just I shot down. I did the first section in 18 hours, slept at my friends in Tennessee, and then shot back here in 10 more hours after that. And yeah, I just lived here on an air mattress for the first few weeks, and then I just would upload. I would drive to McDonald's and upload my videos off McDonald's Wi-Fi because I had no Wi-Fi set up that. here. And yeah, the lighting in here was t- terrible, and I just... I just filmed some videos here until I got it all set up eventually. What year did you move down here? 2021, okay. I think. So you've been here for a little over a year and a half, almost uh, two years. Well, it's been two years. Wow. It would have been, I moved here September of either 20 or 21, whatever makes that over two years. Yeah. So. Was it a hard transition getting used to being down here or since you'd been down here so much, you were just like, this fits, fits like a glove. I love it down here. Um... It's hard to, like, I feel like when I came down here, my mind was, like, not even thinking about that. It was just kind of like, I just got to make this work. Yeah. So I was more Go focused. straight back to work. Yeah, my mind wasn't even thinking about any of that. But honestly, the first the first night I moved here, I I had never felt it before, but I almost had, like, a mini, like, panic attack because, like, reality set in once I got here. I'm like, I just bought this place, and it's never seen any of it, and... I walked into the house and the house had been vacant for a while. So it's like, it smelled kind of old and muggy and I'm like, man, I might have just fucked up. Yeah. Like it just place have mold. I really got like something like set in that I've never felt before. And I was like, this is, you're in it now. Like I can't just go home tomorrow. Like I'm, I'm two days away from my house. Wow. And I was like, whatever. And I just, yeah, I the MR2 like, and started working. That's like, so sick. I like, I gotta keep making videos. I love the fact too that you touched on, you know, moving down here and sleeping on an air mattress for a few weeks, like, cause you just were so focused on working. Yeah. I didn't, I mean, yeah, for the, like, until I had like friends and stuff over, I had my mattress on the floor cause I just, I didn't care about my living arrangement. I'm fine with, I'm content with just somewhere to stay and eat, but yeah, I'm not big on furniture i love that man (laughs) putting all my effort into the cars and channel well one of the questions that i like to ask a lot on this podcast is like about sacrifice so what do you think your biggest sacrifice is to date so far 
I feel like, you know, you've described some of these crazy things like moving into a house in Loveland and not having a job and like just running out your savings or sleeping on the floor for three weeks, like moving to Florida sight unseen. Like, do you have one that comes to mind that's just like, man, I risked it all and it's paid off? Yeah, I mean, I think I think just leaving Colorado in general was the biggest like sacrifice. And on top of that, it was just like it was it was literally just I didn't knew nobody out here essentially. Like I knew some of the YouTubers, but I didn't know them on a super close level to where I could just go hit them up and hang out. I just knew of them. We would collab yeah. together. So I I came down here knowing nobody. And I think the biggest thing is just leaving all the friends and family behind too. And that's probably about it. But as far as setting myself up for success being here, I think, you know, it was, I'm not sacrificing much in Colorado to leave it to be here. It's just what I grew up and what I was so used to. And yeah, just, it's, it's hard for someone to just kind of be like, screw it and just drop it all. But I just could clearly see that if I moved there, it, it should be better. It was like, it was a calculated risk in my head. I was like, if it fails, I can always just go back to Colorado. It wouldn't be terrible, but I just didn't see how it could be worse if I have, if I can do stuff year round and like meet new people, the channel's already big and established at that point. I was like, I don't see how I could, I could fail going out there. Yeah. So I was just like, well, especially it. like leaving, like you're saying, like, you know, you left the comfort of home, like what you've known as home for your whole life. So like coming down here and like creating a new network and new friends, like challenges you to get out of your comfort zone. And like, obviously you had traveled all over with the YouTube thing, but coming down here and having to make a new network of friends, like that's probably helped even grow the channel further. Yeah, I'd say so. And I think, uh, a big thing that, uh, helps on videos and just whatever it is, is like just meeting new people. Like people like to see that Mm -hmm. something I found interesting. It's like, I was digging into like what, like Pixar and DreamWorks, like what cap captures an audience. And it's like meeting, it's like having new interactions with people. It's like, the biggest thing that people want to like people like seeing other people meet for some reason so yeah yeah, like i didn't think anything could uh really go too bad and i was like i already knew everybody in colorado like i made my network out there so i figured why not come out here yeah home base 2.0 do you have any plans to go back to colorado like during the summers to do any like bandamere track days are you just pretty much like home base and out of here for the foreseeable future the original plan was to go back to Colorado like half the time. Originally, I wanted to come here for the nice, like during the winter and go back to Colorado because I still have the shop out there. And it just ended up being easier to stay out here. And I just kept moving more and more cars out here. <laughs> but I do want to go back more. I think we're actually going to go back here soon. Just for now, it's just like a weekend, like personal trip. But I know they have some races coming up down there that they put on. And I still have a couple of vehicles down there that I could get fixed up and go race down there as well and i do plan on going back there but now it's almost backwards where it's hard for me to go back because i have moved everything here so i still have a setup down there but it's just we got so much going on here now it's just i don't need to it it would only be if i wanted to yeah yeah like a little bit of a getaway from from here yeah if i was like you know what i feel like going back and seeing some friends and stuff and you know i can make some videos with the guys down in pfi do that so totally so we've talked a little bit about um, like some of the comments you've received, like people kind of the white noise. Do you have an insult that you've received over the years that you take as a compliment? Mm, not really. Nothing that stands out. <laughs> there was one on the back when the channel was getting started, the uh the video where I was racing people in the Civic, someone commented on there and they're like, get a real man's car or get a yeah, like get a real man's car, pussy. And I was just like, and I replied, I said, but I'm only a boy. (laughs) I spelled it (laughs) B-O-I. And it was just like, I don't know. That was just one of those dumb comments back then. But none of them really stood out. There was definitely a lot where people would say, I, you know, what I was doing wouldn't work. None of them were like usually directly hate comments. Yeah. But just people saying something to say something. Yeah. I feel like that's all it is. Yeah. Keyboard warriors. Yeah. A lot of keyboard warriors. But I don't know. It never really affected me because people would People would, you know, with the history of the channel and stuff, people would make their own assumptions about me. And there's like, there's definitely the group of haters for like every creator out there. Sure. And I just learned to kind of ignore them because I was like, there's nothing you can do about yeah, it. Well, there's whatever. more people that love what you're doing than the people that nobody actually truly hates it. And everybody just likes to have something to say, right? Yeah. And no one 
and, and it's just like at the end of the day i know how much work and effort i'm putting into this so it's like someone who would sit back and like discredit me for what i've accomplished i'm like it's not even worth my time to listen to them for so sure it's like whatever dude yeah has there anybody has there been anybody like in your personal life that has been very critical of what you've been doing or from in the beginning thinking like it wasn't going to be successful and like kind of doubtful that you've changed their mind along the way mm, definitely had a couple that were like and i don't want to call any names but i've had some people back then that i wasn't even like super close with they've I would I would like show pictures of what I was doing with my car and they're like, Oh, that'll never work. Why'd you put that motor in it? This and that and then just ended up proving them wrong. Yeah. And they've come around, but nothing nothing like serious though. Nothing like I've never had a real life friend hater yeah. kind of thing. So I mean, most of the people once because like my car was already kind of established by the time the channel was a real thing. So people kind of knew I was somewhat serious yeah there was some awareness there yeah like i was already you know a fast car on the street and stuff so usually if i said i was gonna do something i would do it for sure and yeah i don't think many people personally really doubted me yeah along the way were your parents like concerned about you jumping more into being like a full-time youtuber or were they just kind of seeing the vision with you and trusting the process i think they trusted it pretty early on i think it took a little bit of convincing, but I would like assure them, especially like my mom, I was just like, I promise you there's people making a good living off this and it can be something if I stick to it. And there was definitely that that buffer zone where she was, you know, pushing me to get a good job and, you know, go do what I did uh, with the welding and trade school stuff. But, you know, eventually it just grew so quick, so fast and she saw like what I was doing with everything and she's like yeah whatever just keep doing it mom it's doing I have good. a real job now yeah, yeah she never yeah. like she never stopped me from doing it she's not That's like super cool yeah, she she always she's always like you'll you're smart you'll figure it out yeah. she always assumed like I will get it done so she trusted me in that aspect That's so cool How well, do they feel about it now? Are they stoked? Yeah. Sick. Yeah, they're they're proud I continue to just do this and go. Do they come down visit you here in Florida often? Uh my dad's only been out here once and my mom's been here good handful of times we have events that she will come down for and help us like do the merchandise and stuff that's so, super cool she's been here pretty often you've done a ton of really cool big events over the last few years do you have any that have been your favorites mm. i mean they're all they're all like equally as fun i'd say uh i really enjoyed like when we first started coming down here we would come for the events that Cletus was doing and they're called Cletus and cars. And those were probably some of the funner events because when we show up to those, we don't throw out any of our own personal events. So he, he made those events back when, you know, he was starting to grow a following. So those events, those events are probably the best because when we show up to those, it's literally just fans of like him and us and other content creators. So when we go to those, we find our like loyal subscribers, they show out, they show up and, come talk to us and hang out with us because we don't go to many things where we can actually like meet and greet our fans sure. so we do those like cletus and car events and we get to bring the cars and run them down the track and everything and our fans get to see all the cars in person and you know they're they're just all coming up to us like oh it's crazy seeing you guys in person this and that so i think those are probably the the, the cooler events that we get to do when you get to interact with yeah the like I, I like meeting our fans and stuff i think it's cool yeah it's cool i mean i think it's cool seeing like from an outsider's perspective the relationship you have with the people who watch your stuff too like seeing you just down in vegas and like a dude let you borrow his car for the time down yeah. there like that's Shout insane out, like sure that's he, so crazy dude. he's one of those like he uh, yeah james he's like one of the fans that i can tell is there from the beginning because sometimes you don't know what you get with a fan yeah. when a fan comes up they're like oh i love your stuff and be like, oh yeah, cool. Well, yeah, we got the MR2 out here. You can go check it out. They're like, oh, which one's that? And I'm like, yeah. oh, you not really watched. And then like, like him, he's like, oh, I've been watching since like you first got the hatch run. Like That's all, you so know, like cool. since way back when. So I can tell there's like, there's the dedicated fans. Some buy-in, yeah, yeah. There's definitely some people that say they watch just to say it, but then there's definitely some real loyal fans that I'm like, damn, this person. Like they'll tell me about stuff. I'm like, damn, they know my life. Like, yeah. from like, the I beginning. don't even remember that. Attention. That's yeah, cool. They're like, I back, I watched when you had braces on, and you're just messing around so we definitely have some pretty dedicated fans out there and it's just it's crazy to think because 
it's just weird. Yeah. Me. It's not weird. It's cool, but it's, it's like, just crazy. Man. I'm sure. Yeah. Do you have any moments that stand out to you the most, like from meeting a fan at an event, like something that's just like stood, stayed with you? Um, I mean, there's definitely, I mean like that, the one with James is definitely a good one for sure. We ended up taking him out to Vegas and stuff. It was fun. But now there's definitely a whole bunch of repeats that we see at the Cletus and cars. Like I have, I have several where we've taken a picture every year. They've come and they'll come back and show me. Oh, and that's like, cool. Every year on Instagram, they like, they repost the same picture, but with the new one. And I got a few of them. So it's like, they got me for the last like four or five years from day one and just like shows how like different we like our first Cletus and cars we show up with just us in the cars and the next one we like have ourselves in a little walmart tent selling shirts cash only and then the second one you know it's like we we have a nicer tent our cars get nicer and like yeah. we slowly progressed and uh yeah those are pretty cool but um there's definitely a lot of fans that have reached out and like given us parts and just done really cool stuff for us there's probably just too many that i could I couldn't just pull one out of the air right now, but sure. there's definitely a lot of cool experiences we've had. That's so rad, man. So going back to like some of these big events, is it hard for you when you're at a really cool event and the fans are around or you're setting out to like accomplish a good la- uh, track time and your car breaks? Like, how do you react in those moments? Yeah, I, I, it definitely happens, but I don't usually think too much of it. I'm just like a little sad if it's an event we're at and I know there's a lot of fans because there's some events we've like taken the MR2 out to and it just something happens to it and we can't run it because I know people want to come out and they pay to come see the stuff so it's it's something that is just in the race car world it might work it might not so when the cars are at this level so definitely sucks when they break down and we can't like do something in front of the fans but end of the day most of those people show up just wanting to meet us and see us get signatures take pictures with us anyways a lot of the the serious fans so when we go to those events, I pretty much, you know, set my mind aside to like, we're here to hang out with the fans and like, I'm not as focused on the car. If it breaks, it breaks. Yeah, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to waste yeah. the rest of the day trying to fix it and like do that. So no one could see us. So I'm going to say that is what it is and just talk to the fans and do that. Whereas if it was a normal track day and we didn't have fans, I'd just be dedicated to the car, or whatever, and doing that. So I definitely try to set the the events aside for the fans and make time for them that's super cool they make it happen so yeah Yeah, i think it's important to have that mindset and like that perspective to understand like that those people are the ones that like continue to make your community up and make it as cool as what it is and like to pour into them as much as they do for you which is cool man um we touched on it a little bit earlier and before we started this podcast you fired up the mr2 let's talk about that thing for a little bit is it still the fastest one right now that you're aware of currently it is yep what's the last time you ran in it um well the, the, fastest, the fastest time, time i should is, say yeah it's been a 7.76 in the wow. quarter mile it like 185 miles an hour jeez man so when you got done with that did you know that that was the fastest time that you'd hit in that car when you came back around um on that specific pass i didn't think i did no um the biggest goal with that one when we redid it so like i did the when i did all the stuff myself then i realized it was like it ran an eight three and i was pushing to be the first in the sevens because there was a handful of other ones trying to run a seven second pass and like that's a moment i feel like we couldn't like once you're the first into something it's like you know that's a big accomplishment like we're the first ones to do it Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to do that to show that we were capable of like doing something cool when there's all these other cars with people that, you know, quote unquote, know what they're doing when I'm not supposed to know what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm like, we can build a car that's just people as that fast have, like, as these guys. Teams yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And then some of these guys are also like single individuals like me, but you know, a lot of people still doubted my abilities. They started to, they started to realize that, you know, it's something serious when it ran the the bottom eight second passes, but. I realized the car was like at its limit. So we decided just to rip the whole thing apart and redid everything. And it ran the seven second pass. And that was pretty big for me. Honestly, like after that happened, I was like, I'm kind of done. I was like, at this point, I'm kind of coasting because that was like my biggest goal is to like prove to people that like we could put a car together that was like legit and fast and respectable. But yeah, I did the first seven second pass. I did a seven nine. I was super pumped on that. And then 
Uh, then we just kept taking it out. I did a couple more seven nines. I did like a seven eight, and then eventually got to that seven seven, and it still sits as it is after that. And we still have yet to turn it like all the way up. Damn, so it geez. just just shows that it it worked after we redid everything on the car. We That's just learned a lot cool. after the first version of it. So when we rebuilt everything, we did stuff in a just certain way. And like, even we're like, more. we're gonna make this thing just work good yeah do you think that's one of your biggest accomplishments to date was hitting that seven second pass probably yeah yeah for my personal accomplishments that was probably the biggest one for me because like yeah i had that car from the beginning it's and it's one of those cars that um like not many people built mr2s to be fast because if you're a car guy in the in the car world like every every car has kind of been done already sure. if it's like a somewhat popular car in any sense like a Civic or a Toyota Supra or an RX-7 or a Skyline, like all of them have been fast already. Mm -hmm. Like there's no way I'm going to have the fastest Civic because they're going like, one just went a 6.9 at like 200 Jeez. something miles. An hour. Like these cars are crazy fast already, but for some reason the MR2 had never been fast for whatever reason. That's and I think it's because they just didn't have the aftermarket support, but eventually someone got the idea to put a honda motor in the back of one because that's what's powering it is a honda engine even though it's a toyota mr2 and the the motor that's in there has a lot of aftermarket support so now there's just this explosion of honda powered mr2s because they make the mount kits to just put that engine in and parts are accessible so i just thought we should do that because no one's done it yeah. and something i've learned that is you know, it grabs people attention when you do something that's never been done. Sure. And especially with that being like a mid engine car, it's like it does wheelies easily and stuff. So it's uh it's just different. Yeah. So I just liked the challenge and I happened to have the car and the you know, the following and like a new goal to push for. I was sure. Like, oh. Did you was that car kind of the same thing as the red hatch? Like you kind of just bought it by happenstance and didn't really expect to do what you did with it, or did you buy it with that specific purpose? Well, I originally bought it with the purpose to street race yeah because <laughs> the hatch was really fast on the street but once it made like six seven hundred horsepower since it's a since it was only a front wheel drive car at the time now it's all wheel drive so i could debate it backwards but at that time all wheel drive civics weren't really a thing it, people didn't really do it so it wasn't even a thought in my head um they couldn't get much traction on the street just because it was front wheel drive no sure. matter how well you managed it they like they had a limit so if i made a thousand horsepower on that civic it would be useless on the street. Whereas in the MR2s, I seen a video on a 1320 video and someone had K-swapped an MR2 and because it's mid-engine rear wheel drive, all the weights in the back, it has the same power and weight as a Honda, but it can actually like hook all the power you throw at it. So sure. they were like gnarly on the street. Nothing could touch them. So I'm like, if I want to be like top dog in my area with like the setup I kind of am already used to, then I got to do like a MR2 or something. So my intent was to make that one make like a thousand horsepower and I was just going to go just try to wreck people on the street was my goal. But yeah. then the channel kept growing and I got more and more off the street. So then we just started taking it to the drag strip. So then I just started looking up what's the fastest MR2 in the quarter. I was like, I bet we can beat that guy. And then just started going that route instead. That's so crazy. Was that the first car that you experienced a wheelie in? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it was. That first time you hit that, you put the wheels up in the air. Did it scare the shit out of you? Not the first time, no, because no. the first couple were little. It yeah. was like little tiny ones. They just barely come up a couple inches off the ground. But then we were at an event in Arizona and we like, and it was already like, it was starting to run pretty good and we were getting the car figured out and it had like more in it. So we're like, and I made it to the finals, like in this race. So it was like me and this other guy and it was like, you know, it was, it was a race between first and second place. I bracketed my way all the way through and I was like, we got to turn this thing up because like we knew it could be turned up, but I never had a reason to and i was like i really want to win this race and we turned it way up <laughs> on the on the launch and it, <laughs> and it freaking shot way up and it drugged the back bumper oh my it came way gosh. up and slammed really hard and that time i was like damn did it break anything when it came back down no luckily no and I've, i actually did it twice and i did it a worse Jeez. time again later because that was i did that to try to win a race and then the second time i did it was to try to set the record which wasn't even in the sevens yet i was just trying to beat it was like an eight three at the time or something when it still had the the other setup in it and just turned it up a little too much again and a little too much sauce that one was actually yeah that one was even worse because 
it came all the way you can if you guys when we're done with this you'll see like the back bumper has the paint scuffed off it and i have a picture of it and all four tires came off the ground because it was just just caught the on air. the back bumper oh, wow and that's crazy it and then slammed back down and that one actually kind of tweaked it tweaked it a little bit yeah. so luckily i was able to straighten everything back out but then after and that's and that was one of the reasons like we decided to redo everything because i was like that was one of the things we did right away is with the new computer we put on it those fuel techs mm -hmm. um the first thing we ordered uh was a little laser height sensor so now it has a sensor on the front of the car so when it does a wheelie if it goes you know over a certain threshold it has a little table in the the computer that pulls shuts power it, down. it doesn't wow. just shut it down but it progressively pulls power like tapers yeah it if it tries to if it tries to rip up off the ground it will shut it off but it it has a table so the the cut gets progressively more and more so it, we have it so tuned now to where it just it'll come up the front tires will just barely pick up off the ground it'll pull just enough power to hold them there and then the car will settle back down and, and go so now wow. i know i can launch it as hard as i want and it won't be able to do a wheelie that's super wow. cool you just had an issue with that in one of your recent videos loading up your nsx right mm -hmm. yeah, yeah we put another one on that car just because i was going to try to do some drag racing with that one and it does wheelies too and the weight split on that one's even worse like that was a lot of a lot of the things we changed on the mr2 was like putting the fuel cell in the note like because they do wheelies because there's just so much weight on the back is the nx uh, nsx rear motor yeah it's just like the mr2 okay it's technically mid-engine it is mid-engine there's okay. mid-engine yeah, yeah. rear engine would be like a volkswagen bug sure. where it's behind, behind the, the rear yeah. tires which is even worse yeah but the nsx is the same way and it did a little wheelie without even trying because it has like its gas tank in the back it has a big intercooler in the back it has all this weight back there and we were bringing it on that show so i didn't want to and i knew i was going to get antsy out there and send it so i yeah. didn't want to damage that car so we put that one on a fuel tech as well and did the height sensor and then just copied the settings from the mr2 sure. into that one so but yeah when you were loading it up like I, oh that yeah it was yeah. cracking up man you guys were trying to put it i watched that video you're trying to put it in the back of the semi and it kept stalling and you're like yep. well, does this guy not know how to drive a I, car yeah i made him look bad it's because the sensor was <laughs> activated so it's coming up on the ramps and just shutting the car off and he I was probably he was bugging it. too he was yeah. probably like what is going on yeah i knew how to so drive confused. this <laughs> yeah <laughs> do you have a dream that was car my bad. build what's your what would be a dream build for you mm, that's kind of hard to say um at one point it was the mr2 the street version the the mr2 when i originally built it was like built me building my dream car with the sequential trans like a thousand horsepower street mr2 that was my dream car and uh now i got a i don't know if i'd consider them dream cars or just like project ideas because like i got a whole, i got a few others now that are like kind of all on the same level of awesome and i don't think one really stands out but an idea i've always had it's like a dream car is um i'm sure you guys have seen like all the hoonigan videos with like ken block like mm -hmm. doing gymkhana stuff and something i've wanted to do is there's this guy who's designing a a twin k-series engine so it's a v8 but it's Whoa. so it's those two k-series honda motors but like integrated into one so it's a v8 with like k-series heads and he calls it the k48 because wow the normal one's a k24 so it's like two of them so it's gonna be like a full billet block deal it's and he's like getting stuff together and it has a lot of following on instagram it's crazy um i'll have to called, check that he's out called that neutron engines yeah and i've talked to him for a little bit and um i've never really told anyone about this idea but i've always thought it would be cool to like take that engine and put it in like a newer civic type r because they they look pretty dope like the new civic type bars yeah. and like wide body one completely tube chassis and this is if i could just poof it up out of nowhere yeah like, somebody gave a you a million bucks yeah if i had a full tube chassis uh civic type r like wide bodied out full blown race car with that k48 custom v8 like twin turbo making enough power to be like reliable but also gnarly going to like some sequential all-wheel drive trans and basically building like a jim Connor civic essentially they could Damn. like do those sort of like they could do those sort of stunts that would be bad with like the active aero wings like everything that would be like probably that's like a, a build i've thought of yeah but yeah i could see that coming in your future i've i've talked to him about it it's, it would be a ton of work it just sucks how much work cars are yeah it's especially like, when you're talking about something with like active arrow and all the computers that control all that stuff like it's yeah it's pretty nuts man it's surprisingly that's still that's probably more of the simple stuff it's just the actual physical time it takes to take the thing apart cut up the chassis start bending tubes and mm -hmm. measuring stuff and 
I would have to get someone to like create the suspension in CAD and then get it all actually made yeah. and make sure all the suspension geometry is right, get custom spindles and like everything for the axles. Like it would be a, just so much custom stuff. Like they take, unless you have a big backing, it takes a long time to yeah, build a like car a full at that team level. to do each piece of it or something. Yeah, there's like another YouTuber, Rob Domini, has his four rotor RX7, which yeah. is essentially on that level, but you know, he's been building it for four or five plus years just because it every little thing has to be custom built. Sure. So the only way those guys are building those cars in the time frame they are is just because they got a big budget. Yeah. And they got big shops behind it and they just go all hands on deck and knock it out. Whereas for some guys like us, like we know what we're doing, but we also aren't like that. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's well, gonna and you're take also us like time. trying to go out and enjoy the stuff that you already have, you know? Like yeah. you're not just trying to spend all the time in the garage. I was super invested in the stance works that 308 Ferrari and like watching him yeah. create all that stuff and like all the stuff in CAD and like every piece of it. And then he'd build something and be like, oh, it doesn't work and have to like yep. rip it back out. Yeah, so that's, that's Mike. He's really cool too. Yeah. Like understanding the amount of work that goes into a project like that is like, dude, it's freaking bizarre. It's, so. it's a ton. And I have days where I step back and look at all the cars and I'm like, dude, I don't know how we even got to all this stuff. Yeah. So I'm like, geez well i'm sure to think how much work it all was to get all of them to even and they're still not all dialed they still like will break half the time and it's totally just, part of the fun if right? i had to start over i'd be like no <laughs> <laughs> i only want one yeah i'm sure that's like becomes a headache though when like you have like you know you break one car and you're like okay i'll take the next one out and you like kind of go through all of them and next thing you know you have like three or four cars that are broken and you're just yeah, like it's a well now we have to work on three or four it's cars. a never-ending cycle and we just and we always try to push them to their limits because like that's just what i like to do i yeah. don't know why but yeah it's a never-ending cycle being a car youtuber is probably i i would argue a car youtuber is probably the the toughest yeah and but at least it's a sustainable job because you can just keep creating more content yeah, based off of broken shit that's the advantage i think it has is because like car youtubers as long as you're thinking of new cool stuff and there's always new cars and projects to buy your audience will probably stay involved for a long time whereas like other types of content creators are kind of they're yep. temper they're temporary. Like gamers will only you'll they'll come in their phases every couple of yeah. years and then they fade off. Someone pigeonholed. You can only play Fortnite or COD so many times. But like for some reason, I think if we keep doing what we're doing, I feel like the car YouTubers they just stick around yeah. as long as they keep it interesting and keep doing stuff. Yeah, like you said, I think there's always new platforms coming. We're like talking about this new uh, V8 style Honda motor that's about to come along like shit like that it's cool that there's always progression happening in the world of cars yeah i want to jump back a little bit to talking about your dream build you touched on um the ken block stuff um uh, rest in peace to a legend right. but uh you had the opportunity to race his daughter how did that come about <laughs> yeah she freaking stomped <laughs> us dude <laughs> um but that was just uh that was pretty out of nowhere as well what were we doing? I remember we had to scramble for some reason to make that happen because I had something else going on. But it was last minute, out of nowhere, just one of the guys from Hoonigan hit me up and he was just like, hey, you want to be on a, this versus that with the Hoonicorn, with the MR2? I'm like, and I, I knew right away we were going to get smoked. Yeah. It was like, it's an unprepped track. We're a rear-wheel drive car. I knew we were just going to get decimated. I didn't even try to win. Yeah. But Zero like, how confidence can you pass up that, that opportunity? Like, I'm going to do that just for the publicity and just because I want to meet Ken Block and see the car. Yeah. And it, I don't care if I have to ship it across the country. And uh, yeah, they, they messaged us and I scrambled to find some stuff last minute and we ended up, because I had like less than two weeks to figure out how to do it all wow. when they hit us up. Was it like an Instagram message or um, like YouTube? I think it was a text. No, so wait, that, oh, that's I have sick. one of their numbers. Yeah, you, I think they texted me. Were you bugging when that came through? You're like, this is real? I don't think I was... I don't think I was like starstruck like that, but I was like, oh shit. Yeah. They got the Hoon, because I, I thought the Hoonicorn was like gone because yeah. of the partnerships or whatever, but they're like, oh, they're bringing it back for another series. And I was like, I don't know if they're ever going to do that again. So I was like, yeah, well, I figured it out how to, because I originally wanted to like bring the hatch or the minivan because they would have been a more suitable opponent because they're all wheel drive. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the hatch was all wheel drive at the time and the van was like broken for some reason. So yeah, the van would have been an epic. The van would have been cool. <laughs> Yeah, but the MR2 is the only like reasonable one to go. I could have sent the NSX maybe, but yeah, it ended up being the MR2. So I was like, I didn't even care which car it was. So I was like, yeah, let's just do it and send it out. And then, yeah, we did that. And that was pretty cool. 
Yeah. What does that experience mean to you now that Ken's no longer with us? I, I'm just really glad I did it, honestly. Because yeah. I feel like if that happened and I didn't do that, I'd be kicking myself now because it was really cool to meet him. That's he's a really rad. cool guy. And he's like, he's into it too. He's like, you know, off camera, genuinely asking us questions about the car and like, cool dude that's super that's rad cool. man yeah i'm sure that that's one of those things that'll stick with you forever like what an opportunity dude um so i want to jump into talking a little bit more about like how you manage life between like filming and like real life like do you have a balance that you strike or is it kind of just like like you mentioned earlier you just want to work i i'm pretty terrible at it honestly but um I wish I was a little more organized. I pretty much just film when there's something going on that's film worthy. Um, I used to stay up a lot more like late at night working on stuff, but now like I have my girlfriend stuff in here. So I'll usually go to bed or go inside at a somewhat reasonable time now. But before I would just, it was 24 seven, I would be up all night. Cause when I was by myself, like I was just, I'd be working all day up all night editing. But now that I have some help, I can kind of, fall back a little bit and I, tr I try to balance it as best as I can I'm still not great at it but I just you know with the cars you never know which way you know you could plan for something to go a certain way I'm like okay we're gonna film this today we're gonna get this done we're gonna get it running and then we were missing one little bracket or something stupid that like we could have never thought of and it's like sets us back a week sure and I'm like well shit I'm, I don't want to post this like unfinished video because I was like supposed to have it running today and yeah and then that can like snowball into the next thing I was going to do the next day and it's just it's pretty on the fly because it's part of it's definitely on me but at the same time like it's just cars are unpredictable yeah there's outside variables too yeah like I said it's not like a, it, I always compare it to like video game streamers like they can just hop on do whatever whatever happens happens because yeah. it's just that's it yeah, but it's pretty for controlled. a car like you get to make it interesting like you know you got to have something somewhat cool happen in the video either a first startup or like a new part or you know you got to make it cool somehow because it's just like oh i'm putting i'm not going to make a video i put my wheels back on the car today yeah like <laughs> yeah nobody wants to watch yeah that. it's like you got to try to at least try to think of something cool so i'm definitely not the best at it but i'd Definitely try to hold my own and just film what's interesting when I can. I love that. Talking about uh, going inside at a little bit more of a reasonable hour now, have you fallen asleep out here in the garage while you worked? Not out here, Not no. here? Mm -mm. Have you ever? In the Colorado shop, yeah. Yeah. We had a couch upstairs and there's several nights where I'd stay the night. That's super cool. Is there a way that you like to de-stress while you're creating content or if something's going wrong on the car, do you step away and there's like a method that you use to like clear your head? Mm -hmm. Not really. No, if I'm, if I'm kind of fed up with something, I'll honestly just like ignore it for a bit, go on my phone, <laughs> get distracted. Yeah. Probably not the best idea, but yeah, I just kind of step back and then maybe I'll think of something else I could be doing instead. If like something's not going well on the car. I was like, well, maybe I can, work on this and get something else ready for a video tomorrow or i'll just start thinking well what will i do tomorrow or just think ahead i don't know sure well i feel like that comes along with like that calculated mindset too being a little bit more of like i can remove myself and go do something else and come back to this later and i don't have to be upset yeah that's super super rad well uh as we get into wrapping this up for somebody that's looking to get into YouTube, whether it's in the automotive space or something else, what type of advice do you have for them? Um, if they're looking to get started and they haven't, the first thing you got to do is just start because without nothing, you're never going to grow from that. So you got to at least make up a channel name, go from something and uh, just start filming what you're doing. I don't know. Everyone's going to have their own vision of what their channel could be if they're serious about it you just gotta step back and think what could i do that's similar to what people are doing but in my own way or some or just think of something completely new and unique but i think the biggest thing is if you're going to get started you have to make yourself stand out in a way that would set you apart from other people and i think the best way to do that is doing something new and unique because if you just follow exactly what people are doing you're not going to stand out but see what people are doing to see what works but make it your own and then just start because if you sit there pondering at the very least at least if that's all you got is to you know do something that other people are doing or just something that you might not you 
you might think it might not stick out, but at least it's something that's better than nothing at the same time. And then you at least try to get the ball rolling and then you might get new ideas and stuff as you go. Yeah. You might get that one comment from this guy that says, keep it up. I love your videos. And then I'll just ignite like, the oh, fire. Damn, I got to go. This one guy's watching me now. Yeah. That's so <laughs> wise words, man. Mm-hmm. If you could go back to 18 year old Kyle and give him any sort of advice, what would you, what would you tell him? I don't even know. I'll just tell him to probably just keep doing what he's doing. Honestly, I don't think I've, I don't think there's any, uh, huge huge set of advice I could give myself then that would really have changed the outcome now if I knew it sooner I think I was always like kind of on the right path and the only thing that kept me back was just my my resources and sure and what I could afford to do at the time all I know now is if if actually if 18 year old Kyle had the resources I do now he would have been crushing it yeah I've I've definitely reeled back from where I was but back then I would do so much with nothing but I just tell him keep going I love that. Trust sure. the process, mm-hmm. man. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Um, last but not least, this might be the hardest question of the whole show. Do you have any final motivating words for anybody listening? Just keep on pushing, man. Don't give up. Don't okay. give in. There's a lot of negative stuff going on out there. You got to push it aside and just go. I love that, man. Okay. So good. Well, dude, I appreciate you letting us come set up in the shop, hang out for a little bit. This has been a treat. Yeah. Thank you so much, dude. For sure. I wish we could have got a little bit into more of our quick backstory, but maybe another yeah. time. Yeah. I mean, we, we still got time if you want to do it right now. I mean, keep, how, how far are we in? We're uh like an hour and 30 minutes. Oh, that ain't even that bad. No. <laughs> Go to two hours. Yeah. We can keep it going, dude. All right. Keep slinging. Keep it going for the people, man. I like it. Yeah. I mean, I'm here. What else are you guys doing tonight? Yeah. You're looking at it, dude. Yeah. We're... uh. We just have to be in Orlando tomorrow sometime at one. Oh, so, cool. Yeah, we're cruising. So, yeah. I mean, we want to talk about the skate park days. Yeah, we could a little bit. Yeah. Freaking sandstone. Yeah. Sandstone. So, we all know each other through Sandstone Skate Park in Longmont, Colorado. Yeah, because some people might finally now be like, who are these guys? Yeah, what for correlation sure. do they have to How Kyle? How do you guys know each other? But, yeah. yeah, I've known Mike for, like we said, freaking probably 10 years it's super crazy man me and matt were talking about it on the way over here today he's like i don't think i've seen kyle in like forever you know and like yeah it's pretty bizarre to think back to that era of kind of just running around the skate park when we were all just young kids really not knowing Doing some dumb shit at the skate park. always do just like shooting fireworks or oh drifting a car around with uh meal trays underneath the tires or, or getting in fights and yeah getting in fights yeah it was just the skate park was always a wild and crazy time man so yeah i feel fortunate to like <clears throat> even go back there because like matt just moved back to longmont um which is crazy yeah, yeah. <laughs> every time i go back there i just reminisce on those days because it's just it's so different all the people are so different now and it's like it's so funny like next time you're in town we all gotta have like a, a reunion session there because i'm down yeah, those days were something different, man. Super fun. I think the skate park actually helped me quite a bit because I was a pretty, I, was, I didn't have any siblings or nothing growing up. So I was just, I was pretty in my shell and like the skate park environment definitely kind of brought it you kind of toughens you up for life because you're like, damn, there's some fucking crazy people. Yeah, there's crazy showing stuff up to the going skate on. And like, not that anybody's like, especially in your friend group, not that anybody's necessarily like talking shit to you, but it's like everybody's having fun, like poking at you and giving jabs, yeah, you know? And it's and like, like, and it's like you, I feel like the, I'm sure there's other environments that teach you the same thing, but it's like, you can take a lot away from going to the skate park every day with your homies. Cause it's like that you build that friendly competition of like trying to outdo each other yep. and you build up a lot of just social skills there, meeting new people. Like, like I said, I'm sure there's way more environments to compare it to, but at least for us, it's uh definitely kind of sets you up for the real world in a sense. Certainly. I always go back to saying like, I loved getting to spend time at the skate park and growing up riding bikes and in your case scooters but like you learn that like if you just keep trying that you can figure stuff out right Mm -hmm. and it like that spills over into so many different areas of life whether it be your youtube career or business or whatever it is and like the beauty of that is like when you're doing this like when you break something it just costs money when you fall off your scooter you're getting hurt you know what i mean (laughs) and like that's i i always think about that with traction you know it's like the worst thing that happens is we lose money. Like I'm not going to break my arm. 
Like yeah. That's pretty crazy, you know? And like, so the yeah, risk once, versus reward is a little different. And like, once you set up a good baseline for yourself, like your bills are pretty much taken care of. It's like, you can just start to take risks and it's like not too scary. Yeah. At what point in life do you think you went from being that calculated thinker to a risk taker? Because it seems like now, especially after just sending it and moved to, moving to Florida, you're like kind of sending it a little bit more and just starting to take more risks here and there. I'm, I'm st- I'd still say I'm pretty calculated and yeah. s- still hesitant. That was probably one of my bigger risks is moving out here, but I'm slowly getting there, especially like with that car I just told you about I got. Like those are kind of more send it kind of purchases. And yeah. I'm just slowly like just see where this goes. Like the NSX was a big purchase of ours. Like getting the truck was a big, big one for us. And I'm just slowly starting to get more comfortable like acquiring new projects and doing bigger things. Sure. Because we can only, you know, rebuild our turbo Hondas so much. Like it, at some point I got to realize that I got to move on to like different projects and pro- and try to step outside my comfort zone. Yeah. Even though like the Hondas and everything's all I know. But I'm going to start trying to do other projects that I've had planned. Even if I don't know anything about them, I'm just going to hop in and learn. So I think those are some dope. of the bigger risks. Yeah. But I, uh, I was wondering, you know, you have a Porsche sitting outside. Do you have any like goal or ideas to do anything exotic down the road? Um, well, something I haven't said about the Porsche is that my plan with it, I don't know if it's going to work is that I, and I do want, yeah, answering your question, I probably would get into some more exotic stuff later on, but I still think it's a little soon. But uh, probably do like an eBay turbo kit on a Lambo or something. That'd be funny. Like <laughs> that would be the, awesome. the cheapest possible kit on a Lambo. But um, I actually picked that one up to be a future project car. And I think I'm going to try to put a, a three rotor engine in it. Dang. To that like would a, be sick. To like a Mendiola, like tran- which is like that transmission back behind you. That's That one is actually going into the, the sand rail that we have in Colorado. But basically that same similar setup to like, because the Porsche is also mid engine, mm-hmm. not rear. So it's just like the MR2, but instead the engine sits forward and the transmission's like just behind it instead of being sideways in there. Sure. And yeah, I'm going to try to do some stuff to that one in the future. But once that happens, I would probably need to replace that one with a nicer, newer daily. So I've always, if you know, the funds are there, then I might pick up a newer nicer Porsche or something like that because I really love that car. Yeah. They're nice. They're fun, aren't they? Yeah, they're cool. Yeah, those things handle so good and they're just quick and zippy and Mm -hmm. they're cool, man. Do you have eyes on anything or a goal Porsche that you're looking at that you would want down the road? Mm, Not necessarily. I mean, it's something about me too is it's just so hard for me to justify spending, like getting a new GT3 RS or something. Yeah. Like people... I just have to have so much extra money, I feel like, to do that because the amount that car costs, even the payments on it alone, I could build, like, 10 other cars that are, like, way cool, like, not cooler, but just, like, 10 badass cars for content just for the price of this one stock car. And, like, people will be like, oh, that's so cool the first day I bought it. But then after that, unless I'm not, like, doing some gnarly shit to it which is just going to cost me more yeah i know i'm gonna fuck it up <laughs> then, yeah, and when you fuck up a car like yeah, that you really like, fuck it up then i would just yeah it's just these cars aren't at the level yet to where i would be comfortable like picking up a super nice exotic it might maybe something newer something still like definitely under six figures yeah but you know if i'm going to be spending that money then i'm going to make sure that this civic you know the nsx we still have like the Honda Prelude back in Colorado. All those cars are ironed out and they all have like top of the line parts and they can no longer be better than they currently are. Yeah, max them out. Max, yeah, do max mods on all those before because I can just get so much more content out of those and just keep tweaking those and make them good. But eventually one day, like they're getting like the MR2 is basically maxed out. We're doing a billet block in it soon, but then it's that car is almost maxed. The hatch is just about where I want it to be. They're all very close. So sure. like that next transition for me to start doing new out of the box projects is coming here pretty soon. But at some point if things keep going the way they are. Yeah. Well so. and you're starting to venture into boats too. So Yeah. Got a couple couple boats. <laughs> this already. fan boat sitting behind you is freaking <laughs> insane, dude. You fired that thing up and I bet that thing parties out on the on the water. Let's see what happens, man. Just don't you guys might have to be careful. Might suck your hair back there. I no, know, geez. man. Tie that thing up in a man bun. Dude, I guess so. <laughs> Where's the where's the jet boat at? It's parked under the carport over there. Heck yeah. I was gonna say if you guys were here long enough, we could probably go take it out. Dude. If you guys have time to come back, we could just go like rip it real quick. Yeah, we'll but, be back on Sunday. Because we have a lake like ten minutes away. No way. So 
I mean, depending on if this, we need to go test this and if the airboat's ready, we could just like take them both out real Dude, quick. The airboat, yeah. <laughs> that is the most Florida man thing. Like when I saw you guys bought that airboat, I was laughing so hard of like the walk around of it, like how it was all set up when you were like showing it. I was like, there's nothing more Florida man that you could purchase. Such a hoopty. I'm pretty sure we were watching that episode together. Yeah. And he's like, he's like you have to see what Kyle just <laughs> bought. He's bought this boat. And I, I just like, no go, way. I want to go take it to the Everglades and I just... I just want to get to a point where we're just like surrounded by gators. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you'd have down. to be sitting up there in the captain's chair so they can't get you, man. Yeah, and then just pray that little drain plug doesn't pop out. Dude, for real. Then your gator bait. I know. I always forget like that there's that gators exist down here. They're in the lake we go to. That's so crazy. But they're very timid. It's like the attacks are. They're pretty used to people. Rare. Yeah. Well, I, I just heard something today from a. We were at a restaurant and this guy outside had a little baby alligator, like letting people take pictures of it and stuff. And he said that if you see an alligator in the wild, kind of close to you or something, and you swing your hand, like you're pretending to throw something and it catches its attention and comes to you. He's like, that means some asshole has fed it. And those do bite people because, not because they're doing it out of like hatred for you, but like they naturally think that you're a feeder to it so when they get near you they just like attack anything that moves wow. that it's either on you or what you throw to them so he said if you do that and they stay calm and like don't acknowledge you or anything like they're safe and you can like literally i would never do it but he's like you can just hop in the water and like go right up to them and they won't even hurt you wow and, like you could swim with them if you wanted i was like you can do that but that's what he yeah, said though. like i'm like, not down but it kind of makes sense yeah I mean, if there's a gator at a public lake and you just and it's being fed every time you're there like you know, for it's sure, if a person that. is standing there and they like look like they're throwing something in the water, he's gonna come over there for sure. So, well, that's like I was telling Matt. Like, I grew up going to Southern Georgia a bunch, and like a bunch of the lakes we'd go fish on when I was a kid. Like, there would just be you'd be sitting in the boat, and like a gator would like bump up against the boat, like swimming by, and it'd just be like so eerie. But like, there'd be people wakeboarding in the lake and like swimming, and I would just be like, I just remember being looking at that and just being like, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. I'm it's not little, down. When I first moved here, I didn't realize there was many in this lake. I didn't see any in there, so I just assumed they weren't really there. But then, like, during some warm season, we went out, and they were, like, everywhere. And I was like, ooh. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to hop in this water anymore, even though they only hang out during the banks. And anytime we've tried to get close to them to film them, they just, like, scatter. Tear off, they're yeah. very timid, but uh, I don't uh, don't want to take my chance. I'm not testing my luck water. on that one. Nah, dude. <laughs> Is that what's the most surprising thing to you about living in Florida, like non car related? I don't know. Probably just the weather's really consistent here. Yeah. Because people told me it was hectic, but it's like the same every day. Like people that live in for- Florida argue that it, the weather is bipolar here. And I was like, so you're like, you ne- have no idea. Yeah. You've never been to Colorado. <laughs> and like, I'm sure there's other states that are just as bad as Colorado, but I was arguing with one of, one of my friends and they're like, like, oh my God, it's so crazy here all the time. And I was like, I just pull out my phone and the high and low temperature is like the same across the board, <laughs> like 72 degrees high all day and then like 50, whatever low all day. And it's like the most perfect, I couldn't even make it up. Like within a degree, all identical. Like, Let like, me show you where I grew up. Yeah. And I was like, you look up Longmont at 70 today and then negative 10 tomorrow. Dude, you know, straight you up. Every season of the day. Yeah. Every season of the year in a day. You, uh, you had a weather, a hurricane recently right we had a couple well we had one tropical storm and then one was an actual like category two or three by the time it got to us and it started as a four was that pretty scary it wasn't too bad i thought it was going to be a little worse and i was just worried about our carport ripping out of the ground and it was like definitely trying to yank on it some but it stayed down but that one was bad like it messed up fort myers and there's still like people with no homes and stuff that was rough yeah yeah seeing that stuff like i haven't seen it in person but like seeing videos and stuff of it is like pretty mental man yeah and we were supposed to get hit pretty dead on but like we got lucky because it swooped low it was supposed to swoop right through tampa and it was supposed to hit tampa with full force and then it, it came low and hit fort myers so by the time it got to us it was already down i think it was like category one or two actually by the time it hit us so it wasn't crazy but that would have been real bad but the only good not the only good thing but like one of the better spots or the better things about being where I am is we're pretty inland so even if it hit Tampa directly by the time it it'd still be bad if it got to us but yeah. um, the land weakens the storm a lot so we're not close enough to have any real flooding or anything like that we would just see gnarly winds and then sure. our biggest thing would just be like, like our Carport. roofs getting pulled off or debris hitting us which still wouldn't be good but 
mean, overall, we made out pretty good. But there were tr- old oak trees that had fallen and covered our roads. And they people had to go out there and cut them up with chainsaws. And it was still pretty bad over here. Yeah, pretty scary, I'm sure. The first time you get to experience that, I don't know what I would do, man. Yeah, the first, tro- the first tropical storm wasn't bad. We were, like, hot, chilling in the hot tub, just hanging out. It was all windy. <laughs> I mean, it's a thing down here. They have hurricane parties because so many people have pools in their backyards here. So they'll just... Everybody's just hanging they'll out. They'll just be out there with the storms ripping. <laughs> they'll just be chilling in the pool. Florida's so different, they're man. They're crazy. They're built different down here for sure. They yeah. really are. Dude, it's so wild. Well, heck yeah, dude. I think I think we can wrap this bad boy up. Have a couple more twisted teas. Is would you say twisted tea is the official unofficial beverage of the Boosted Boys? Yeah, that and Monster Energy. Yeah. Dang, dude. I meant to bring you. The Monster Energy Hard Seltzer. Oh, you yeah, I remember you they snapped exist out of me now, about that. dude. I was laughing so hard. I was like, my man's yeah, going to be I definitely psyched. say uh, why it brought the twisted teas upon us. Yeah. But we just have them all the time because of him. But then, yeah, my thing is definitely the Monster Energies. Oh, yeah, dude. Just wait till you try these these Monster Energy Seltzers. You cannot tell a difference between the energy drink and the hard seltzer. That's dangerous. It's pretty bizarre. That's dangerous for all drywalls out there. Uh huh. <laughs> I saw, dude. Now is the time to invest in drywalls because all the Kyles are going to be going crazy. Mm-hmm. We uh we drank a case of the monsters. What was that last week? And uh, I almost turned into a Kyle. I think so. Are they? Do they still have like the same? energy they don't have any caffeine okay but I was they're, like, dude, yeah. they're just playing with some dude fire yeah, yeah like, that'd be like, like they leave them, if yeah. they leave them fully loco. if they leave them fully caffeinated oh and just add gosh, the alcohol dude well because it's like six percent alcohol so it's like they're gnarly yeah it's pretty boozy Are they still can, the full size can it's uh i think they're 16, 16 ounce uh or maybe they're 12 they're like a slim can okay so it's um, like smaller than a four loco yeah what's a four loco like 12 percent they're yeah. up there, aren't they? Those, those, they're gnarly. Dude, those things like are eight so and a half, ten. I forgot what they are. I mean, growing up, like you remember Cooper, right? From oh, the skate park. Yeah. Like that dude loved that stuff, the dude. And when they discontinued the original Four Loco, which was like 12% with like a shitload of caffeine in it, that dude went and bought like a pallet of that stuff. <laughs> and like, I'd never forget like drinking that and just being like, this is the worst thing to have ever existed. They're not that great. No, but dude. But they will fuck you up yeah they will get you man but yeah those uh those monster things like it i could put the energy drink in front of you and the seltzer in front of you You could taste both and you wouldn't know which was which that's dangerous it's pretty bizarre I'll have to get some yeah slippery slope dude well sweet man well uh we'll have a couple more of these and hang out i guess sounds good heck yeah we'll wrap this thing up um well if you guys are enjoying these episodes on spotify Hi. apple or amazon please follow the show on the app to be notified when new episodes drop every friday and leave us a five-star review And if you're watching on YouTube, please hit that like and subscribe button. It greatly helps us continue to make this project happen. And with that, keep being scared of normal. We'll catch you on the next one. Later. Peace. Bye.